So this talk is about using BHAT as a web app automation tool. I'm Carl DeBishop. I'm a DevOps generalist with BioRaft. Uh, what that basically means is I do spend some time writing Drupal code for the five Drupal applications that we run, but I also spend a lot of time interacting with the infrastructure folks, doing things as low level as DNS, and mostly working with the containerization strategies, both deploying the containers, managing that, building that architecture, and building the tools so that the rest of the development team has pretty direct access to those tools that are built off the containerization. I'm Kathy Thays. I am Yes CT on the internet. I also work at BioRaft. I am a web developer there and also a liaison between our project managers and the dev team. And I participate in weekly deployments. Oh, there is a, uh, if you want to look at the slides on your own phone or computer, you can access them at bit.ly slash bhat auto tool. And there's also a link to that from the camp website uh, from the session node. Right, this is you. Oh, that's... Oh, but I need to go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> we have some things to work on. Wait, back. There we go. Okay. So just a little bit about BioRaft. Um, BioRaft builds software to allow institutional research facilities to manage their, manage their laboratory research safely. So this is academic institutions, it's uh, commercial companies, but we have these laboratories that have high transit high transition of people coming in, coming out. We have lots of exotic chemicals, biological agents, animals going on, and the, private, the investigator has to actually try and get their research done. And we're trying to take all of that burden off of them as much as possible so that we know what's going on, we can fill out the reports for the regulatory agencies, keep their people safe, and free them to do their investigations at the same time. We've got 10 developers, we use an agile development process, we have a Docker-based infrastructure, we've got 80 live customer sites, which include some very large academic institutions and some very large commercial institutions whose names you would recognize immediately. Yeah, and uh, part of, so part of having these uh, 80 live customer sites is we have those same sites replicated it di in different environments for like RC or staging or development. And that's going to come into play later when we talk about how we um, use the tools. Um, so first we're going to talk about uh, how we came up with this idea, uh, why we needed it. We'll run through four examples. The first example we'll go through a little slowly. Uh, and then the next three are kind of repeating some things, so those will happen a little faster. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, some next steps and some places to take it. And we'll have time for questions. Um, who here is a PHP developer? Who knows what a BHAT test is? Who has used Jenkins or Rundeck? Cool. That's great. Um, How did those get I put them like that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have these 80 customer sites, and um, the company's been around for a really long time. And so our main um, customer UI is a legacy Drupal based web application. Um, we are currently. Uh, building new features and transitioning old features into Drupal 8, uh, but we use the legacy web application as the front end and Drupal 8 as the back end for some of our things. And uh, Drush does not work on our um, legacy web application, so we need some way of automating tasks. When you have a Drupal site, for example, one of the things that you do a lot is clear the caches. 
And so if you're working on a Drupal site and it's like, something's broken, it's like, oh, wonder what's broken. And like the first thing is like, try clearing the caches. <laughs> and uh, with Drush, that's command line tool, and you can type Drush clear caches, and it'll clear the caches for you. But if you don't have that available, you need to um, do it manually, but you can't do it manually on 80 sites in like four different environments. Um, so we, yeah, so we still need to maintain these sites. We have uh, tool, we have these tasks we have to do, and we have to have a way of automating them. Uh, we actually have a couple of ways. Uh, so we have a um, tool written in Ruby uh, that is uh, based on water and selenium that we can use to press buttons in the admin UI. So on our legacy web application, we have areas of the admin UI where we can do things like say, resave a theme, or clear the caches, or do these things. Um, but we need a way to automate that. Uh, we, one way that we have is uh, this Ruby script. But the Ruby script requires uh, different um, tools to be installed, uh, Ruby. Um, uh, if I want to add a feature to this automation, then I need to write Ruby code. And I wrote four lines the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but because I know PHP really well, it's easier for me to write PHP, and I'm excited about learning Ruby, but it would be nice to not have to do that if I'm trying to like implement a new feature and like work really quick and be efficient at my job. Um, I use PHP Storm to write PHP code, and I edit this Ruby program in PHP Storm, but I'm not getting all the benefits out of that that I could if I had the right plugins and the IntelliJ something something to make Ruby easier to do with like the linting and the syntax highlighting and everything. Um, and what else? Yep, that's it. So, um, since I don't have Drush, and I'm not super expert at writing Ruby, um, we have another alternative, which is to use Behat and then automate things using uh, Jenkins or Rundeck. So Behat, thanks. <laughs> uh, Drupal's PHP based, uh, Behat is PHP based. Um, there's a couple of layers to Behat. Um, let's see. So with Behat, you can write English-like words that say things like, uh, go to the home page, uh, click the apply button, look for a message that says hello. Or like it's written in English. And then each of those like steps that you want to do in your Behat uh, scenario for actions that you're going to take uh, is uh, like a PHP function. So Behat's cool because I can have a coworker that knows a test path for something and they can write it out in English and then a developer can be like, oh, well that step to do that test, let me just write some code and they write PHP code. So it's like a combination of English and PHP code. It Kind of, it's the other way around in terms of that, and this ties into the testing. The PHP Storm environment knows how to read everything that you've defined for BHAT, mm -hmm. so that if your people who are writing the test paths have PHP Storm also, they don't need to understand the PHP. The PHP Storm will say, "Oh, you started to say go to, and you either meant you know go to page with URL this, or you meant." go to the end of the line, and it'll give you that as completions. So it's English-like, and PHP Storm will prompt you on the exact English that you need in order to trigger the PHP functions that are happening in the back end to drive those steps in the scenario. Mm -hmm. um, Behat is a composer-based installation to get that running, and uh, Drupal 8 is composer-based, uh, so that's nice. Those tools are the same. Um, 
like uh, the server that's going to run Behat uh, needs Composer and PHP uh, versus like the server that's going to run uh, the water script needs like Ruby and stuff. So if we can eliminate the need for the Ruby application, then our infrastructure is simpler because the things that it has to build are more consistent. Uh, so the Behat uh, can let you um, do steps on a web page, which is what we're going to use it for. Uh, but we still need a tool to like do it on 80 sites or um, do it on all 80 sites when I press a button or take some options. So to scale that uh, to, for automation, we use Rundeck, uh, Run Jobs. It has a UI, which is great, uh, with forms and buttons. Um, so it's not a command. We don't use it uh, like a command line tool. So this uh, allows more than just developers to be able to do things. Uh, and you can also permission jobs. So like as a developer, I can see a section on Rundeck that maybe our uh, tester people see a different section. So this is also pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about Behat. Uh, so big picture wise, <laughs> I can't make this picture big. I don't know how to do it yet. I'm going to find out. Um, so there's a directory structure uh, for these BHAT um, tests or scenarios to run through. Uh, you need like um, some general information about your tests and your project. Those are the context for things. So we have something that's a feature context. Every kind of thing that you want to do or test about your site is a feature. So we have a bunch of files that are features. And then inside features, you can have multiple scenarios that you want to run through. Uh, in our examples, we just have one scenario per feature. Um, and then a scenario is like um, clear the caches. But you have to do like a bunch of steps. So each scenario has a bunch of steps in it. Uh, and some kind of assertion, like um, make sure you didn't have any errors, or make sure the page says saved. Uh, so that's a little bit... Oh, and then the other part of BHAT structure is there's a BHAT.yaml file. YAML files are usually written, uh, used for configuration. So this is going to describe like a, some stuff about our site. So we've got feature context, Features, inside features scenarios, which have steps, and then we also have a BHAT YAML that is going to talk about our site. All right. So this is looking at the run deck, one, one of the jobs that we run, and we'll be looking at uh, the two parts that make up this job in a few minutes. Um, basically, as Kathy said, you know, we've got some forms here. This is the site that we're working with and the deployment environment. So it could be the development environment, it could be the production environment. And we can use Rundeck to decide, OK, if you're a developer, you get access to all the development environments. But guess what? You're not deploying stuff to production because that's something that we have a controlled gated process for. And then this last part, there's an option for the admin password. And what's happening here, you can see two things here. One, this is secure because it's actually being drawn from secure storage within Rundeck. And this indicator here is telling you that there's a default option that's being put in there, which is coming from that secure storage. Go ahead, Pat. OK. And so I can define all these passwords in the secure storage in Rundeck. And once they're defined, you know, nobody can get in them. I, I can't get them. Either. They're, they're locked down. Uh, you can do the same sort of thing with other automation tools like Jenkins. This just happens to be the one that was more suitable for this, uh, this workflow that we had. We also use Jenkins and we could do the same thing. Um, so this is within Rundeck the definition of this set of jobs. Um, it's basically defined by the BHAT YAML file and some of this stuff is quite small so I'm going to sort of point out some stuff. There's a default configuration that defines 
the suites of tests that we're running. So you can sort of say, I want to run production sites or development, uh, production tests or development tests. Um, we only have one here. There's a context, a feature context, which is defining some configuration, some variables that will get passed through and links to that feature context.php file that Kathy pointed to earlier. And then there's just a definition of the extensions here. Um, you'll see this again. We Intentionally, the goal here is to simplify our deployment architecture and simplify what's involved in coding changes through that. So we intentionally kept that quite minimal. So we really just have the BHAT make extension, the good driver, and, um, and then something to output debug information so that we can look at the results of how that test ran. Uh, the last part to notice here, way down at the bottom, you can see the options that are listed, the site and the environment you saw. Those are combined together up here. You can't see it in the, the screen here to make this site name, which would basically be like earth.rc.biorf.com. Um, for the, to simplify what we're showing here, we actually plug this in as an environment variable, but we plug it into the YAML file on our Rundex server. The other part of this is this admin password, which you remember was the third option on the last screen that you saw, and Rundeck automatically plugs that in here where it says at option admin password. Yeah. So um, remember there's a, a link if you want to open this up on your phone or your computer. You can zoom in on the pictures. bit.ly slash bhat auto tool. <coughs> And this is just running that, you know, calls the job, puts dots to the steps it goes through, and says, yes, I completed everything. So it uh, gives you a nice interface, as Kathy said. You can see, I can see if somebody else has run that. They can see if I've run that. We can see what the results were. We can look at all the reports, the logs from the last week or whatever. So it, it gives you a pretty comprehensive view of what's happened on your deployment uh, history. Okay, so this is, as I said, the tie to the feature context.php. Um, this reflects, again, we've got a very minimal set of installs here. It's just enough to get things going. Uh, the good driver is just a, basically a headless JavaScript free uh, browser. Um, keep it light and simple. We do have to bring a couple things in from that BHAT YAML file which is, or well, it's really one thing. The BioRAF users was defined in the YAML, and this is where it gets injected. So we pick up the BioRAF users from the BHAT YAML file and stick that into the array that the, the future context has that um, we can refer back to to pull in the username and stuff like that. Next. This might be you. Nope, this one's still here. Steve, still me? Okay. Um, and so here again, this is the BHAT YAML file that we're actually using here. Um, so we are sticking in the admin name and that password from the feature context. So BHAT YAML, which I'm um, masking the password, sticks that into feature context, and you have it in the array. You have it accessible for all your PHP functions. The one difference here between what we have on Rundeck and what's here is we don't have the site URL for the BHAT make extension. Instead, go ahead, Kathy. We can just pass that through as an environment variable. So the base URL here, and we're using a, um, a Docker container on the local laptop using nip.io to show all of the examples that you'll see in the next several slides. All right, super. So now we're going to do the first example, um, hopefully kind of pulling all that together. Okay, so the, uh, the first example is re-saving the themes. So what happens is we have uh, all production sites for all of our customers, and then nightly we copy the production database and some files down to our different environments. So we have a RC and a staging and a dev. And when we copy that data down, the theme has some like 
cache and hashes and stuff in it so that um, after you copy the production down, you open up the staging site and it looks super weird because it's like, I don't know where the theme files are and what the things are. So we have to re-save the theme. And uh, we would do that uh, manually by using the Drupal admin and going to like build, themes, appearance, find the theme, find the page, and like hit save. But we can't do that on 80 sites times all of our environments. So we're going to automate it. And so we have automated it here with a BHAT test, but we're not using it to test whether or not saving the theme works. We're using it to actually save the theme. So this is a feature. This is the English words. It has one scenario, and the scenario has steps. Uh, so we're going to reset the theme. The scenario is to save the themes. Uh, hmm. I, don't know, I don't know if we're clearing the cache or not. Um, so the first thing the scenario is going to do is, given I am logged in as admin, and then I go to admin slash build slash theme slash settings slash bioraft 3x and I press the button save configuration. Then I should see the configuration options have been saved and I should not see any errors. So this is what we want uh, to have happen automatically and then we do the same thing for the mobile theme. So we have two themes on the site. In order to do this, uh, BHAT needs to know what given I am logged in as admin means. BHAT doesn't know that automatically. And it needs to know what the words I should not see any errors means. Like it doesn't know that automatically. Uh, with Drupal 8 and Drupal 7, uh, there's some BHAT um, helpers. Uh, that's already in the community, but this is a legacy web-based Drupal-like application. Uh, so we write our own. So we have to tell BHAT what to do. So now this is PHP code, and this is stuff our developers know how to write. Uh, it says uh, session, go to user, find the field name, fill it in with a value, find the field pass, fill it in with a value, press the login, assert the display name for that user shows on the page. And then assert no errors is for I should not see any errors. It's going to get the page. It's going to look at some CSS and see if it finds any error CSS on the page. It's going to count how many times it sees an error occurred during processing. And if it does, it'll say I found an error. So we've got the English stuff. This is the BHAT test that we're using to do an action. We had to define what some of these things mean. We defined it with PHP. So we'll, when you run this, you can run it on the command line. And uh, you run it with like vendor bin BHAT features and then the name of the file that has your features in it. And that name of that file is what has the English in it. And BHAT will helpfully print out what it's doing as it's going, and it'll tell you one scenario, one passed, it had nine steps in it, nine, nine passed, and how much time it took. Uh, this is the problem. So when we copy production to a different environment and the caches and hashes and stuff don't work, the theme looks not great. And then we resave the theme, and then it looks nice. Uh, Earth is the name of our demo site, so that's why you'll see it in here. All right. Oh, wait. Okay. So, that was example one. Um, questions? Because now we're just going to go faster. I just want to, can, can you actually see the document before, you, uh, before it's saved? When you're about to save, you go back to the page. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are just about ready to save that. Uh, Can you see what it looks like before it's actually saved? Because but then you've not done spell check or any verification of that. Thing. Well, in, in theory, yes. But in practice, what we're trying to do with this is to use the BHAT testing structure, which would give you the ability to save screenshots and do this other stuff. 
that you could then send off to your developers and compare before and after and do all this great stuff. Right. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to use that same plumbing okay. to have this happen quickly in DevOps. So quickly means headless, no JavaScript, right. instead of printing out JPEGs and all that stuff. And in a DevOps environment means, yes, we are capturing in the logs that it failed or not, right? You saw a couple of steps back up that we have that debug files thing. But the content's not actually changing. We're just pulling it over. We just need to use this for the automation step of saying, go and press the button. So yes, in general, but in this case, we don't really care because we already know what the content was. I mean, this was what was in production. Yes. We just copied the database over. I understand. We're, we're misusing <laughs> BHAT here. We're extending its capability. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's see. Right, so. Um, all right, so we got big picture BHAT. We had to write some PHP, which allowed us to write some English, which allowed us to write a feature in English. And we have some tricky bits here, like with the username. Um, the username, where was that bit? This is, so in our feature, which is written in English, we don't want to type out what the username is. Uh, well, I guess we type, we don't want to type out what the password is and then commit that to Git and have it in our repos. So we use this trick in the feature context combined with the secrets that Carl talked about in Rundeck in order to still be able to do things as admin without having to put admin password in our repos. Any other questions? Okay, sample two. All right, so this is another one of the things that you imagine having to do on a weekly release cycle is update all the modules, do all the update PHP when the modules come through with their update hooks. And this is, this is what we need to do that. We just need to log in as admin, go to update.php. We find, need to find the element that will do the update and then confirm that that's there. We press update, it'll start the updates. The problem with this is that because we're using that good driver that does not have JavaScript, it doesn't work with the normal updates that you see on the, the update PHP page. So I can wait for five seconds and I can change that based on how long I expect those updates to take. But it's not, that part is not going to be like every week. You know, one week we may have no updates at all. Another week we may have 20 minutes of recalculating database fields for each site. So, so this part is a little bit of a sticky part with this approach. Um, but once we go through and calculate what that's going to be, we go to update PHP, look for op equals finished, and we should see that the updates were attempted, and we could add another check to see that there were no, um, no error messages printed. So we had to add just that one function to click on the element with XPath and it's one, two, three, four, five, six lines of, of code. Um, and that was all we needed to add to out of the box B hat in order to be able to click onto that update and, and let it proceed. And this is walking through. We click on the element, we find it. The updates were attempted and everything passed. Okay, so our third example. Um, in Drupal, this is a PHP application, we can write PHP functions that do a whole bunch of code. And we can make um, menu elements so that uh, we have a path and the callback is those functions. So we can have developers that need to like do something that happens uh, like during a release or when you're refreshing a site. So it's kind of DevOpsy, but the developers can use their normal tools and language, PHP. They can write the function that they need, and if we expose it as a path in the URL, then we can have bhat with Rundeck 
automate whatever that is. So this is an example that we use. Uh, the first bits here are cache tables. Uh, we're truncating them to clear the caches. And then we need to do this other thing, which is taxonomy, access, update, database. I don't know what it does. It was already written when I started there. But it's a whole bunch of code. It's 140 lines, and we have to do it whenever we clear the caches. <laughs> um, so we have this function, truncate cache tables. It's associated uh, with um, a path, and it's the callback for this path. So it works with the system. So this is the uh, B hat to do that. The scenario is save themes and clear caches, and it's I log in as admin, and I go to admin raft truncate tables. Then I should see caches have been cleared, and then I also we clear the JavaScript cache. Uh, and then we run it. Uh, so we run bhat, we tell it the name, the feature file. It tells us what it's doing. It says you had one scenario, five steps, the scenario passed, and the steps passed. All right, and one of the other things that you would imagine you want to do with your development sites is not be exposing production passwords on them. So, of course, we want to be able to change the password. And that's a form fill, which the functionality for that is already in B hat, so we did not need to write any custom code for it. We see that we're logged in as admin. We go to the user one edit page. Yeah, obviously, if you're not using user one as your admin, you could use some other token for that. And fill in to the two password fields, the password and the confirmation, your new password. Press submit and confirm that those changes have been saved without any errors. And that's what happens. We have seven steps. It takes a little over seven seconds on my teeny little laptop running Docker. <laughs> okay, so those are our four examples. Um, the cool, one of the cool things about this is uh, we run a bhat test. The bhat test knows whether it passed or failed, um, which to us means were we able to complete the action we were telling it to do. And if it fails, it comes back uh, with a return value of one, and Rundeck understands what that means. So if it tried to do a job, and this was the only thing it tried to do, was uh, do this B hat um, task, uh, it'll know it failed, and then it'll show up as failed in Rundeck. So there are a few things that we could do to make this a little more useful for us. What I talked about in a little bit of length is when we're running the updates, because we don't have JavaScript available, we have to have a, an estimate beforehand how long that update is supposed to take. Two ways to fix that. We could either actually have a write a loop that would go through and check what the status is, what the status is, what the status is. That's essentially what the JavaScript is doing. And then finish automatically. Um, or we could deploy a slightly more complex JavaScript-based um, uh, driver for make for the make environment. Either of those are viable. We just haven't gotten around to doing either of them. Um, the other couple of things that we could do um, right now, this is actually the PHP is on the Rundex server. I needed to have PHP there, so it wasn't too much to add this. But you know, maybe you don't want PHP on your Rundex server at all, so you could run this as a Docker container. Or you could embed this in the legacy application. In our case, the legacy application does not use Composer. So there would be no conflict induced by running Composer to install bhat alongside. But we would need to have a second PHP interpreter on there next to our legacy one. Because bhat's not going to give us with the, the older PHP that we're running on the legacy application. We don't have all the functionality that we'd like to have, so we'd have to have the two side by side in the container, and that adds some complexity. So we haven't decided that either of those two things are necessarily worth it, but there, there are options if, we, if our deployment constraints changed a little bit, and none of them are hard options. Okay, so uh, now we're going to have questions. Um, today's Saturday. 
Uh, tomorrow is Sunday. It's uh, Community Contribution Day, uh, where a bunch of people will be getting together and helping each other contribute to Drupal. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of tasks and mentors available, uh, no matter what kind of uh, interest you have. Um, so not DevOps, maybe. Uh, maybe UI design, maybe uh, translation of uh, documentation, um, uh, running camp events and organizing those, uh, all kinds of uh, stuff is happening and it's happening on Sunday uh, and you would be very welcome there. Um, you get to hang out with folks and find people who are interested in the same thing as you and figure out how to get stuff done in the Drupal community that you want to get done. Sunday is really great. Uh, this is Carl, and I'm Kathy, and uh, you can contact Carl via his Drupal.org contact form, uh, which is K to Bishop, and I'm also ESCT, uh, but don't use my contact form because it goes to email and I never read my email. So uh, you can contact me on uh, Twitter, I'm ESCT, or in the Drupal Slack, I'm, I'm there too. So questions? So, go ahead. <laughs> okay. I had a question that occurred to me as we were talking, which was way back at the beginning we said that part of the reason for doing this is we have this Ruby application that we are maintaining that requires maintaining code in a separate language and maintaining the infrastructure on that. And so it occurred to me, how much code are the these BHAT tests replacing. You saw probably about 50 lines of code in here. I think the B3 updater script is probably about a thousand lines of code. So being able to express these things as BHAT assertions, not only has it allowed us to speak one language instead of two, it's allowed us to dramatically reduce the number of lines of code that we need in order to get these things done. Yeah. So, do you have any, um, I don't know, things you have to do at your job where you were like, oh, I wonder if BHAT would be useful for that, or what is, what the heck is, what else can you do with Rundeck? Like, we're kind of at your disposal, so you can ask us anything you want. Uh, regarding the periodic module updates, what we get in group, so if you can explain, I mean, how to go about it, I mean, just from the basics. Uh, okay, so this is this is a Drupal-like application that's very old. So the updates that we run are the updates that we write. So we, uh, if we have to make an update to our core uh, web app, we're the ones that write that update. Uh, if we have to update a module that deals so with... So actually if it's a community module which has some security updates mm -hmm. or some enhancements which come in. Right. So uh, what we would do is we would watch for those to happen and then we would rewrite them to apply to our very old legacy code base and then we would run our updates on it. So it's not really Drupal. Like it's... Well, Drupal 8 is you using Composer, right? The new Drupal, um, new Drupal, so let's see, how do we do that? Let me think for a second. <laughs> okay, so we have two different Drupal-ish things. We've got this old Drupal thing, uh, and then we've got Drupal 8. Um, so is your question, how do we handle... Uh, yeah, I mean, for Drupal 8, for example. How right. We handle Drupal 8 uh, module updates. You think that's um... okay? So I I work on that occasionally. <laughs> um, so what we do? Uh, we notice that they're coming out uh, every at the beginning of every sprint. We um, have planned to handle some updates and some we postpone. Uh, urgent security ones we handle right away. Uh, big changes to APIs that might break our system, we push off for a little bit so that we'll uh, use them on a development branch and make sure they all work before we run them on production. But once we're ready to integrate those into production, we um, update our composer 
to require the newest versions of whatever, and then we do something. <laughs> like, uh, like we run maybe composer update, we update the composer JSON file, we get the lock file, we make sure all those are up to date, and then we rebuild our images with all those changes, and then we deploy the new images. Uh, every time we deploy an image in Drupal 8, um, the any pending updates run automatically. I think yes. with Drush? Yes. I think with Drush. So when we're um, updating an image on a customer production site, <coughs> or if we're updating an image on a testing staging site, uh, when we deploy that image, Drush, like we've in our code, we've already done the composer updates. And then when we deploy that image, Drush runs Drupal update something something. So yeah. it happens automatically whether or not we want it to. So using the container architecture, the code that we're getting deployed is locked when we deploy the container. So all we have to do is update the database with that new code. So the startup script of the container runs a Drush updb. So that's how that happens. In terms of workflow, you basically said exactly what we do. We, it's mature enough that we can use the composer lock file to control what's being released. So at the beginning of the sprint, we make that decision. Either something is a routine release, and we're just going to let the composer update, pick that update. Or it's a security thing, which we may do a hot patch for, or it's something that's a big issue where we might have a development branch where we need maybe two weeks to think about how does this affect our deployment. All of those routine, all of those routine things get updated, which changes the composer lock file. That lock file is committed, and that becomes the basis for our development for that sprint. So during the sprint, all of the developers are using exactly that locked set of modules. And just by virtue of the fact that they're developing, They've got the containers running on their laptop. They've got the containers running on the continuous integration environments. The testers are looking at the containers. All of those things are using an exact locked set of modules. That's how we provide that level of testing for the things that have passed triage as being not security releases that have to be done immediately, nor big complicated things that need a larger development effort. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Someone? No. Well. <laughs> But the way the updates actually run is with Drush, and they run automatically whether or not we want them to when we deploy the images. So with the hat, are there options for logging more of the output? I know you had a step to look for error messages specifically, but could you log? Does the hat have facilities for logging? Um, more of the text of the pages as you go along, for example? It does. I don't know. Carl knows. <laughs> that's, that's the debug files. They're, they're, if you want to yep. scroll way up towards the top, um, I think you... Wait, wait, wait. Oh, is it in the, it's in the YAML. There right it is. Here. The debug extension captures all of that output and logs that, so I can go back and look at everything that was there. But again, it's not, it's not a screenshot, it's just the text. It's just text or is it HTML? Well, I forget, I haven't had to look at it for forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're, so you are capturing some of the output on every step, even if you don't necessarily look at it. Right, up right. And that, again, the, we see in the error message reporting um, that whether it failed, failed or passed, we see that presently, because we're looping through 80 sites, we see that in just the text of the output, as Kathy said, if we allowed Rundeck to loop, so I wrote that loop in Bash, um, but if I allowed Rundeck to define the set of nodes and run one scenario on an individual node, then that exit status would not be masked by any later actions, and it would show up as a failure in Rundeck, and we'd have a little bit louder thing screaming at us when, it, when there was a problem. But I have to go through my email in the morning to see at, at present because that loop means that only the last thing that happened 
is actually reported as an exit status. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, see you later. Thank you. Not for coffee break. <laughs>